today. I have a rock wall that you literally can't even see because of the overgrown bushes that are on top of it. Yes, if you want to figure out how to change that rockery from this to this, keep on watching. Last dying items that I have not accomplished on my house project as of yet, which is why I'm tackling it now. The nice thing is I even have some help from my beautiful, amazing wife. However, I don't know if that's actually how you use a sawzall. You might be going to start cleaning up this rock wall. I'm doing this due to the fact that these rocks have literally been neglected for years and the sediment of the dirt has actually come through the rocks itself. And you know what? It doesn't look like a beautiful rock retaining wall. It looks like eh, some rocks with a bunch of dirt inside. Yeah. We start actually excavating all the area from top to bottom so we can get this entire area prepped and ready for the next portion of the project. Project. But first off, we need to actually apparently cut a nice large root that's going from the top to the bottom. But guess what? It's no match for the reciprocating saw. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Also, ferns, not my favorite plant of all time, and not the easiest to get out in all reality. But guess what? It still is no match for the reciprocating saw. Yep. Cut it on both sides, and you are ready to rip this thing out of there. Yes. Goodbye. Ah yes, back to my favorite portion of the project, stump removal. And unfortunately I can't actually use my farm jack system on this because it's on a ledge and I can't position it properly, so I'm using a nice link chain and my trusty truck and ripping it out of the rock wall. Yes. Maybe once? Nope. Twice? No? Three times? Come on. Four? Five? Yes, finally. Thank you. That's what I get for having a four-cylinder truck. Oh well. Now, after I have all the stumps completely removed and all the rocks looking pretty damn purty, I actually hose off all the rocks just to give it a good final cleaning, trying to clean it as much as possible before applying the concrete that I'm mixing up here easier for you, trust me. With a clean rock surface, I'm able to dump the actual concrete into place and then just form it and kind of mold it into position of where I want it to be. I then take the rock and actually place it on top of the wall itself and then try and maneuver some of the concrete in and out of the crack areas so I know I'm going to have a good adhesion overall. Now this doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be there so it actually is providing some support and hopefully it stays structural for years and years to come. Yeah, that would be nice. After I have all my large rocks into place properly and you actually maintain it, that'd be a good idea. Look at that. And I even have a nice little helper today. Yay, Michelle, you are a rock star. After all that hard work, you go from one crazy bushwhack system to, look at that, you can actually see a rock retain wall. That's pretty incredible, the vast improvement over what was existing there. Oh, that is one beautiful, sexy beast of a retain wall. Oh yeah, look at that, just so much better. Oh. Alright, so welcome to Men on Fire guys, May 13th, 2020. Uh, it's not always the case. That video actually has something to do with what we're talking about tonight, which is somebody that rebuilt the wall. And uh, as a bonus, we gave you a DIY. So I hope you took copious notes and uh, could build your own wall at your house or something like that. Maybe get on, get on that. Um, we are going through this book, um, How God Makes Men, 10 Epic Stories, 10 Proven Principles. Um, and uh, we've been walking through the lives of different biblical characters every week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we looked at David and how God makes men by doing whatever it takes to correct and restore us when we go astray. Um, last week was Solomon. Uh, we learned that God makes men by making it impossible for us to find lasting happiness in any pursuit apart from him. And uh, so um, this is the big question uh, that uh, we asked last week. Uh, with Solomon was what do you want more than a relationship with God and I hope that you guys kind of pondered that during the week what do you want more than a relationship with God is there something that's in the way that kind of becomes an idol or something that uh, we desire more than just being with him uh, this week we're shooting to Nehemiah who's not a super uh, recognizable character in the Bible compared to some of the other Bible heroes but no less significant and we're going to learn about how God makes men by turning what breaks our hearts 
into a passionate calling to help redeem some broken part of his world. And uh, breaking your heart, um, uh, you know, God's calling on our life, maybe that's kind of Christianese for some of us uh, to say, what's your calling or you've been called by God. And that's, uh, it's kind of like saying, how do you determine the will of God or something? And it seems kind of abstract. Um, and typically, uh, we, when we say God's calling, normally the route that um, we sometimes would take is, well, what are your gifts? What are your strengths? Uh, what do you do? Or what are your talents? What are your skills? And then we kind of apply that and say, well, you can do that for God. Uh, Morley takes a different approach. Um, he starts with and says that if you're talking about God's real calling on your life, not necessarily your occupation or your career, uh, or how you feed your family, but a real calling, it starts right there with what breaks your heart, what uh, angers you, frustrates you, uh, makes you sad, uh, something that really disturbs you about the world that we're living in. Um, and that, he says, is when God calls. And uh, when a, you feel God's tug on your heart about that thing, that is God's calling. And uh, that happened to Nehemiah as well. Uh, in, uh, in his book, uh, Nehemiah was uh, in a situation where um, his people, uh, that he had a heart for his people in Jerusalem, and here's what happened that kind of he felt his calling from God. My brother, Nehemiah. What can you tell me about the Jews who escaped captivity in Babylon? And how are things going in Jerusalem? Those captives who have come back are having all kinds of troubles. They are terribly disgraced. Jerusalem's walls are broken down and its gates have been burned. Lord God of heaven, I am your servant, so please have mercy on me. I and my family and the rest of your people have sinned by choosing to disobey you and the teachings of Moses. But you also said that we could return to you and start obeying you. Then you would bring us back to the place where you have chosen to be worshipped. Please answer my prayer. So for Nehemiah, uh, his heart was greatly troubled as he thought of his people and uh, their land in Jerusalem and what had happened to it. Historically, just as a refresher, um, you know, Israel had uh, kind of back and forth uh, uh, relationship with God, things were going well, uh, they had a good relationship with God, and then if things were going all right, they tended to take it easy, get lax, get lazy, think that they're good now, they don't really need God as strong as they did when they had troubles, and so he just kind of let them do their thing and removed his hand of blessing, and bad guys would come and beat the crap out of them and steal their sheep and their goats and their women and, and uh, beat up their soldiers, put them in captivity. And then uh, they would cry out and say, God, you know, please, okay, we're sorry, we're sorry, we really want to worship you, we know you're the true God, please send us to help. And that happened over and over and over again, back and forth, he would send a judge or someone to save them. And this particular time um, that this happened, uh, the Babylonians came in and just trashed uh, the Israelites and their and their city of Jerusalem. And so it added uh, insult to injury that not only were they taken captive, uh, as prisoners, but that they totally uh, burned the gates and burned the city to the ground as if to say, I'm just trying to wipe your existence away. And definitely um, 
you know, even when some of the people escaped from Babylonia and went back, they didn't feel safe inside that city because uh, there were no walls. And so uh, other marauders and, and Aryan nations can come in and steal from them and threaten them. And so that is what Nehemiah was talking about when he, when he asked how his people are doing. And some of his friends uh, expressed to him that things were not well. But here's kind of the rest of the story of Nehemiah that kind of sums up the book. The book starts where Ezra started. Nehemiah is in exile. He's finding out the terrible condition of Jerusalem, God's holy city, specifically the gates and the walls being torn down and destroyed. When Nehemiah heard this, instead of complaining, instead of worrying, instead of anything, he prayed and God answered. Now, Nehemiah's job was to be a cupbearer for the king, and that king gave him permission, power, a passport, and lumber, and everything he needed to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Remember, the people in Ezra rebuilt the temple. The people in Nehemiah are going to rebuild the wall around the city. And God answers prayer. But what would a good story be without a villain? What would Star Wars be without Vader? What would Lord of the Rings be without Sauron? This story has a villain as well. Actually, three. Tobiah, Sanballat, and Geshem. I'll just put it bluntly. Those three guys are racists who, in addition to being openly anti-Semitic, make themselves the enemies of God. When Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, these guys were angry. They didn't want Jerusalem rebuilt. Nehemiah's walking around the city, assessing everything. Then he just gets right to work with the priests and the Jews who were still living in the city. Beams, bars, gates, bolts, wood, and doors. They built and built and built and built to rebuild the walls of the city. Chapter 3 is a clear description of all their work. As they progressed, their enemies were enraged. Sanballat and Tobiah mocked and belittled their work. They didn't have like a super strong disc game though. Tobiah said, if a fox goes up on the wall, it will fall over. Sensing that their enemies might move from emotional to physical threats, Nehemiah armed some of his builders as guards and protectors and encouraged the workers who were discouraged to keep on working. Nehemiah gives this great speech in chapter 4, verse 14. He says this, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Man, remember the Titans and Gladiator? They got nothing on that. Nehemiah also negotiated better tax rates for the poor in the city and he didn't use his power for personal gain. And the wall was almost finished from the outside at least. It was up and there were no more holes or breaks in it anywhere. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem they're like, Ugh. they send a letter to Nehemiah four times trying to get him to meet them in a field so they could kill him but he wouldn't go. They also sent false prophets to attempt to get Nehemiah to flee the city so they could ambush him. After 52 days of work, people of Israel finished the wall. When was the last time outside of Ezra and Nehemiah that they did something together and completed it. Was it like crossing the Red Sea? I mean, it's just been a long time, is my point. People in the surrounding cities and areas knew it was God who made it happen because it was such a massive and opposed project, and they did it in such a short amount of time. The city was still destroyed on the inside, but the walls were up for their protection. All right, so let's get to work on uh, kind of a wall and the foundation of what we're going to be looking at today regarding ne the life of Nehemiah and God and how he worked in, your, in his life and how he can work in our life. So first, the number one thing, when Nehemiah heard about what was going on with, his, uh, with Jerusalem and the wall, he had heartbreak. He uh, was affected more deeper than just an emotion of like, oh, too bad. You know, this, this wall's down. I so feel sorry for the people. It was more of a deeper uh, uh, core uh, agony of what was going on with his people and that and what was happening there just wasn't a physical wall it's what the wall meant uh protection and uh the pride of the people and uh, what they went through and this was just in disarray so first was heartbreak the second was repentance immediately he went into pray when he felt that we knew it was something deeper than what he could uh handle or what he felt was going on something unusual he repented not that he did anything wrong it's just that the people had maybe ignored him and if there is something that he had done or his people had done, he is asking for repentance and for a cleaning of, it, of his spirit in order to address this uh, situation. And then number three, a vision. God gave him a vision of what needed to be done. And God does these things and Morley talks about these three things that Nehemiah went through. These are things that God's people goes through as well. So in looking at Nehemiah's life, we can see this pattern. And in uh, Morley's book here, How God Makes Men, uh, it is more of a, he calls it a sequence. And it's this repeating sequence that goes on and on. 
So another thing that God uh, did with Nehemiah after the vision part of it is that he tells, send me. You know, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he actually asks God. He doesn't go ahead of God. Remember the, the men that we had looked at previously in these previous weeks, where at times when they went ahead of God and took it upon themselves to do something uh, that they thought was necessary, it got all messed up. It's like putting the cart before the horse. So what Nehemiah did is the correct way of going to God first and said, God, you lead me. If this is something that I'm supposed to do, I want to do this. I want this project. I want to go to the king to ask for these materials. And, uh, and God can align these, that situation, which he was able to do that. He was able to get the money and the materials and the people to go back to Jerusalem to do it, to build this wall and to regain his, his uh, country's or his people's pride. Uh, and uh, the wall being built was a symbol uh, of that. So what do we see that is common in all these situations in well, as well, in these major accomplishments or things that have to be done is opposition. Even though God is in this, there will be opposition like the three characters, uh, what we had just seen in that video, is there is opposition. And it, it's an unusual thing that God uh, puts us in that situation to feel um, he does his own things almost anti-human you know when we feel heartbreak is that a good thing uh, and if you have this opposition is that a good thing you know in our own mind we want the easier road right we want that easier path that we can follow and everything just goes right and we feel good and happy but God uses a range uh, of our emotions and feelings in our relationship with him so right again, it's from the, the beginning of these characters, we need to figure out and know uh, and to read and to talk with other men and to, and to be in his word about how God speaks to us. And it's not just from a cloud. It's not just from a dream. It's not just from other people. There's a multitude of ways that God does this. And one of them is he does things a lot of times through our emotions and our feelings. So we go through a range of these feelings. So with the initial thing of what breaks our heart or what affects us, it's almost like a, they call it a burden or an urge, are these range of emotions. They might be anger, and it might be fear, it might be sadness, but it might be contemplation, meditation. All of these things play a part. God made us and gave us these emotions and feelings as men through this range to work through these things. And the only way that we can truly do that is when we put him first, like what Nehemiah had gone through, and what Morley says, you know, we go through this range of emotions and feelings and a pattern and a sequence, and it's common. He, so he sees that. So we need to be aware of what Nehemiah's life uh, represents and how God led him and how he can direct us. So guys, what breaks your heart? What does, uh, what does uh, something about our world, our broken world, get you really frustrated? Uh, or some righteous anger? Or what really um, causes you to tear up when you see injustice? Um, I've written down several things, uh, but there's just a plethora. Um, but uh, abortion, poverty, elder abuse, domestic violence, orphans, drug abuse, the homeless, racism, marriages, uh, children, education, um, just uh, a variety of different things. And what these all have in common is they're all things um, that in these arenas that are a result of brokenness in our world uh, that wouldn't exist if it were not for the fall and for sin uh, somewhere in our life. Um, and what I mean by marriage is broken marriages, obviously, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, what is it inside of you or in your story, your journey, um, that you feel particularly uh, passionate about, um, but that really stirs your heart that you wish was back to the way God intended. It's redeeming broken creation. If you see in this picture on the left-hand side, it's a short story of the gospel, really, and how God is redeeming creation. There's creation at the very beginning with the one fruit symbolizing the one that was eaten, um, and uh, sin entered the world and uh, the birds and ate all the fruit off the tree and then the tree itself died. Um, but through the cross there that was uh, in the middle of that third tree, uh, the tree was resurrected to life and it's able to bear fruit. 
um, and uh, even have the capacity to to be good again. And uh, and then of course, uh, right now, you know, in heaven, but right now even that uh, uh, the tree bears fruit um, more than even in the beginning and stuff, an abundance. And so in our world, what is it that breaks your heart that you wish that could be redeemed, not just at, at, uh, in heaven when everything will be redeemed and everything will be back to the way it was in the garden in perfect union with God, no crying, no, uh, no dying, no sadness, no uh, conflict, no war. But right now, how can you be a part of what God is doing to restore the world to him the way that it was intended to be from the very beginning? All right, so you might be thinking, all right, well, that's good, Tim. We know what happened with Nehemiah. I'm no Nehemiah. I'm just a guy. I'm going through normal stuff, normal issues. So what does that have to do with me? And how? what can I learn? What, what's the humanistic part behind this, this appable thing? We want to we share with you, with, through Morley's book, on page 111, he uh, titles this one, Four Scenarios for Your Passionate Calling. And that is the thing that we talked about, the burden, the urge, the, the heartbreak, the initial thing like Nehemiah was moved for a reason. Sometimes you don't have a, a reason for, you, you think anyway, for a, a real definite reason why you feel the way you do about the situation that's giving you a heartbreak, whatever it is, the things that, that Todd just had mentioned. Uh, but it's a special thing. It's not just a feeling of you know, I feel sorry, you know, the ambiguity, it's just kind of comes and goes. This is a deeper, heartfelt thing. And so he names these uh, scenarios. There's four scenarios we want to quickly cover with you that Morley covers in his book under that, uh, starting in page 111. Is, uh, and it's things that we vacillate between. Every one of us go through these things, and Morley uh, uses these four points. The first one is, I don't know what to do. It's kind of the stalemate. It's like, it's kind of an excuse. And Morley is, um, you know, kind of hard about um, uh, the readers, of those that use this excuse. Um, you know, it's kind of a poor, we need to open our eyes uh, to what's going on. We need to unzip that, that, that's covering our eyes to see what's really going on in this world and really to see what's going on to open yourself up to those things. And if you don't do that, if you're sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich, you're not going to know what the needs are. and God can't work with you and through you to get these things uh, realized. All right, then scenario two is what we say, what a lot of men and women would say, I'm, I'm just hesitant to start. I don't want to go through this. There's, there's so many things that can stalemate you. Um, we're, we're reluctant. We, we, we don't want to take it on. We know it's there. We know it's unusual, but we have to come to the point where we have to obey God. And uh, to know, we have to actually go through the process and to do something. I always say, you know, that when you're overwhelmed with so many options of what you can do, just do one thing. It's like the, what scripture says, a lamp before our feet. God asks us to take that one step. He doesn't ask us to look the two miles down the road to find out where we got to go because he's going to lead you. And there's so many uh, um, dead ends and, and things in our life that will get us in different directions. So it's not as easy as we think. That's why we can have to rely on him and to obey him to start to do that is to obey him and to say, okay, God, I'm going to step out. You show me what uh, I need to do. And if I don't hear anything distinctly, I'm going to take a step and I know you're going to direct me. And then it goes to the third scenario. Uh, we, a lot of men will say they're going, I'm trying, you know, but it's hard. We need to uh, work and to stay that course and to just be persistent. And no matter, we talked about earlier in his book about Bible time, uh, God does things, you know, in his time, not ours. We want to get the checklist and go off and just do it, or we want to get into that boat, right? And then just start rowing towards what that goal is. But there's a lot of, uh, of, a lot of things, opposition that we talked about earlier that is going to um, cause us to maybe go two steps backwards instead of forward. So this is where the obedience comes in. So a lot of, a lot of people within ministries and things in your life are at this point. Uh, and then finally on, on stage four, you, you see what's really happening. You see the advancement of what God is doing. You kind of see a glimpse of what he has planned for your family, for whatever ministry, for whatever that heartbreak is like Nehemiah. 
going through the opposition, head to, you know, his nose to the grindstone, and he got that done through God's uh, providence uh, in, you know, 50 days, uh, you know, 53 days, uh, and that they were, people that were around that area were amazed, and you see growth at this point. But okay, here's the thing. We are not to strive for this goal. The, the whole process to, to realize that this is a, a foundation of building you wiser, stronger, things like what we're doing tonight, we have a pattern. So we need to be really cognitive of that. So the, the thing that we think we're doing this for, is it just for ourselves? You know, all these patterns, if we have that deep heartache, so it's personal fulfillment, right? It's not. It's not personal fulfillment. It's all directed to God. In Nehemiah, um, chapter 4, verse 10 through uh, 11, they are your, your servants and your people. This is Nehemiah praying. Whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in rever revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He realized that it's not about him. It's about what God wants. It is sub being subjective and submitting to him, his wants and his glory, not our personal fulfillment. So what God wants, what God is doing, what God is changing, what God is transforming is up to him. And we have to uh, let him be the God that we worship and glorify and not ourselves or our own accomplishments and what we can do. Um, I just want to tell you a, a brief example of that real quick before we, we final, uh, go on the final uh, uh, slide here is that my story with uh, Men on Fire is, is exactly to those steps. Because starting this, uh, you know, I started this seven years ago, having a heartache and not really knowing where it came from. I was always involved in men's ministry some way or another uh, with meeting other men and, and promise keepers and other men's events. And uh, there was just a heartache for the men that are out there that either don't know where to go next, uh, don't want to go through the work of, of getting closer to God and still going through the pain. It's kind of a weird thing. There's a ton of men out there that want a certain thing to be closer to God, yet uh, they don't go out there and do it. They don't make that extra step. They black backs and nothing's going to happen. God isn't going to do that miraculous to you if you do not put that effort in there. So with Men on Fire, I struggled with that for many years before I actually started it. And it's been opposition. It's been the, the roller coaster of emotion for me of like, is this really worth it? Am I, are we doing any good? And then Todd came into the ministry and it was just a powerhouse of knowledge and wisdom and, and God's events in his life. And I learned from him. And uh, I would not be the man I am today, even if I was just where you're at in attending Men on Fire, instead of doing anything that's related to leadership, it has caused me to do things in my life, my own personal life, my job, my whole outlook on uh, my government, my society, my world, that I never would have gotten if I did not get involved with a group like this, with Promise Keepers or Men on Fire. It would not have happened. And there was a lot of heart. It started with heartache. It's a weird thing. That's something that I feel sorry for the men out there, and I really did have, a, and still do, and me and Todd still do have a heart for you and for other men out there to get stronger uh, and to go out and replicate that and make other men stronger by unifying together and meeting uh, regularly. So the last uh, slide here we have here, this is kind of an example of the wall, and it's a great example that Todd used at the beginning of this. These are heavy instruments and things, uh, rocks, to be able to put this together. And what the, the, the symbolism that what it means that Nehemiah saw the wall that there was a need and it wasn't just about that it was much deeper. It was about the people of broken people. So it comes down to that. What is your wall. Uh, what is your wall to build or rebuild for him. So what that is going to be our question for not only just a little small group of tonight. Uh, and, but with uh, next week that we're going to bring up uh, next thing before we go into smarter. So 